All righty, so this is going to be the last talk before the midterm. So here we go. Cholesterol and coronary artery disease. So there's a lot of talk about these lipid things. We hear a lot about it. Uh, everybody has an opinion. So let's follow a Big Mac. Um, 600 calories. Uh, by the time you have a soda and fries with that, you're up around 15, 1800 calories. So that's a day's uh, intake for many people. Um, 33 grams of fat, 11 of them are saturated, uh, and a fair percentage of these are trans fats. Saturated fats are fats that uh, have no bonds available. Uh, usually there's a double bond, and you can actually hydrogenate it and make another bond. Um, and uh, that's what uh, people artificially do to create the trans fats. There's 50 grams of carbs, 25 grams of protein, uh, and a gram of salt, 1,000 milligrams of salt. So a half an hour after you ingest a Big Mac, it goes to the stomach, and the gallbladder contracts and tries to release some bile. Uh, if you don't have a gallbladder, the bile just comes down from the liver slowly, but uh, um, uh, enough to help metabolize and, and uh, digest some fats. And basically, the bile is a surface active agent. It basically tries to take the fats and turn them into something that can actually be dissolvable in water. And so it does this by um, not only breaking them down a little bit, uh, but also by having them bind with uh, proteins. So all of these processes form little particles of fat called micelles that are then absorbed in the upper jejunum, three parts of the um, small intestine, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the Santa Maria, no wait, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. I, um, um, so the uh, uh, fat carries some other important substances along with, uh, with it. Uh, you have to have enough fat that you can absorb vitamins A, D, E, and K. D can be synthesized, but a lot of it is taken in. So you gotta have some fat, but we get way more fat than what we need. So once the fat gets in, it travels through the intestinal wall and it turns into something called chylomicrons. The liver starts to work on them. And uh, again, they have to be bound to a protein uh, so that they can then be dissolvable in water. Uh, they're like oil and water. So these chylomicrons uh, have a number of triglyceride molecules as well. And these drop off in the adipose tissue, some of the skeletal muscle, um, and the more carbs you've got, oftentimes the more triglycerides you've formed as well. So you've got to have fat and carbs together usually to create these nasty triglyceride things. So eventually it gets uh, in, ingested and then absorbed in the uh, jejunum, and then it passes through the liver. And so um, all of these particles are then taken into the liver, and the liver turns them predominantly into high density lipoproteins and very low density lipoproteins. The very low uh, density lipoproteins go to the fat and muscle cells, break off a little more triglycerides, and then what's left emerged into intermediate density lipoproteins, and then those are confirmed, uh, uh, converted into low density lipoproteins. Well, the low density lipoproteins are really the bad cholesterol. Those are attracted to the vascular linings, and some of them may even deposit. So what are the things that make those LDLs deposit? Well, if there's a break in the integrity of the blood vessel, uh, some kind of damage. Smoking causes inflammation and uh, cuts and scrapes and uh, all sorts of different things can happen. When that happens, platelets aggregate, try to form a little bit of a thrombus. Um, and also, especially if there's... Um, some foam cells there that the LDL has formed. Uh, you may have some macrophages come along, uh, you know, white blood cells to try to clean things up. Uh, and they actually form something called foam cells. These foam cells are actually irritating to that endothelial lining and they increase the inflammation in a nasty cycle. Uh, interestingly, we think that uh, aspirin may have double effect it blocks that thromboxane A, uh, which is involved in that uh, platelet factor, um, but it also may uh, decrease inflammation. Um, 
uh, we now know that it's really uh, only high risk people that get benefit from aspirin, uh, but uh, it does seem to have some benefit in some people. So what other kinds of things make the defects? Um, you know, basically cigarette smoking, all sorts of different things. Now, what makes you more likely for this to happen? Now, we talked about a lot of the risk factors, cigarette smoking, being obese, a bad diet. The other thing that's really important, though, is genetics. Uh, some people really have a, a tendency to develop these fibro fatty lesions. Uh, interestingly, um, if you remember in the epigenetics talk, they talked about how it may actually be a gene that can be turned off by certain behaviors. Uh, or turned on by some others, um, but uh, at any rate, it is something that is genetically um, passed along, and so the chronic damage to the lining of the vessels, um, including hypertension, poorly controlled diabetes, um, if you have lots of thyroid hormone, it'll actually lower the LDLs, but conversely, if you're hypothyroid and it's not corrected, uh, it'll actually raise your LDLs and make you at uh, more risk for clots. So um, there's always going to be some interruptions, and if an uh, artery is twisty and turny, you're going to have possibility of developing clots. Uh, um, you know, anybody if they're in a plane long enough uh, can develop a clot in the leg. Um, but if it's really high, you're going to be a bit more likely to develop it. And that's why we find that there's a correlation between these high LDL levels uh, and blood clots. So diet, yes, many factors go into the determination of whether LDLs are high. Saturated fats, uh, and especially trans fats, are definitely an important issue. Um, and uh, we really need to pay attention to those and keep those levels low. Homocysteine is an interesting thing. There was a great deal of interest with homocysteine for a while uh, because homocysteine is a marker of inflammation. Uh, it is uh, something that is elevated in some people, and uh, it probably does also reflect, you know, high protein intake and impaired metabolism. It's more likely to be elevated in men than women. Uh, the problem is, is that when we looked at homocysteine as a predictor of cardiac and uh, stroke and blood clot events, it really is not a very good predictor. Um, we used to think that by lowering it, we'd be able to decrease the uh, risk. Um, it's usually lowered by B vitamins, and we really haven't seen a whole lot of evidence of that. Uh, the odds of there ever being a really big study are pretty low, because uh, no drug company is going to pay for that. We might be able to get the government to pay for that at a time where uh, people are not uh, uh, worried about the budget quite so much. Um, but right now, there's really not a whole lot of money to be doing this kind of research. So blood testing has really uh, fallen out of vogue. Uh, maybe someday it'll come back. So uh, sex issues. So if uh, the person is a woman, how does that affect the cholesterol? Well, women have higher levels of estrogen. Estrogen raises HDLs, which keeps the LDL levels lower. Uh, and again, once a woman uh, passes menopause, most of that protective benefit is gone and risk factor for heart disease is roughly the same. Uh, and this is one of the many reasons that we are um, having greater interest in uh, heart disease with women. Intimal lining issue, um, you know, high levels of LDL, low le levels of HDL, some irritation, and you're gonna get a clot. Uh, we don't exactly know uh, when it's gonna happen with a particular person. Um, but if you've got somebody who's a non-smoker taking an aspirin, it's a little less likely, um, but it can happen to anybody. If you've got risk factors um, and when oxygen demand increases, the plaque may be uh, formed um, and blood flow to the myocardium or some other organ may not be adequate and cellular death may have occurred. That could be an MI, it could be a stroke could be um, an arterial occlusion of a limb. Lots of different things happen. Mathematically, it's really fascinating that if you have something that has a radius of one, it will have a blood flow unit of one. Once you get a radius of two, 
it actually goes up to to a, a blood flow unit of four. So even a modest decrease in the lumen of a blood vessel can substantially decrease the flow. So even these so-called stable plaque lesions that decrease the um, radius from a factor of two to a factor of one can substantially decrease the blood flow to the heart, to a limb, to some kind of a um, organ. So what kind of plaques are there? Stable versus unstable. Uh, stable are, are not moving. Unstable are breaking off and going somewhere. Uh, white platelet containing and red fibrin containing um, uh, definitely occur. The significance is still not 100% clear. We do think that the white platelet containing plaques are more common in unstable angina. Uh, in other words, they decrease the blood flow enough to cause pain, but not enough blood flow to uh, cause uh, actual damage. And then the red fibrin are more likely to actually cause damage to the heart. So what else might contribute to blood clotting? Um, certain chemicals such as nicotine, bacterial infection, hypertension, uh, altered breakdown of lipids, um, people with genetic disorders in which they have a particularly high level of lipids, um, uh, diet, uh, and again, we don't know why clots form, but we definitely have some correlations. We know there's a correlation with high cholesterol. We know that some people with high cholesterol don't get blood clots, so it's not exactly causative, um, but um, because of this correlation, we do feel that in general, we should lower people's cholesterol uh, and then statistically, their risk of um, clot-related events will go down. Uh, maybe not as much as people think. You know, when you put somebody on a statin and you lower their cholesterol substantially, their risk of a heart attack will go down three or four percent. Um, it's not nothing, you know. I mean, for those people, it's a huge difference. But it's not like if you're on a statin, you won't get a heart attack, and if and if you're not, you will. Uh, so we try to keep the lipids under. Control. We do this by intervening with diet. We try to get the bad fats and the carbs out of the diet. We know that the average American eats a 40% fat diet. We try to get it down to 30% uh, and especially displace some um, fat with um, proteins more than carbs. The Pritikin diet has a 5% uh, fat. It's pretty unrealistic for the average person to do it. We can usually get the um, serum total cholesterol down about 10% on average with uh, dietary in intervention. So if you've got somebody that has a blood cholesterol of 300, you're probably going to be able to drop it by about 30 to get it down to about 270. Uh, that means that we're probably going to have to do other things. If they smoke, we'll get them to stop smoking. We'll make sure they're getting enough vitamins. We'll keep their hypertension under control. We'll control their diabetes. And we also are going to probably have to start them on medications. So inflammation is an issue. Um, we talked about the homocysteine. There has been great interest in the highly sensitive CRP for many years. Uh, there's a feeling that if you have inflammation, you may have greater risk of um, uh, blood clots. Um, so some people like to test that highly sensitive CRP. Has, again, not played out very well. The only time I do it is if I have somebody that's right on the fence of starting a medication. If they have a highly um, elevated uh, CRP, uh, it's one more thing that uh, may try to convince them to take the medicine. Um, but the prediction uh, factor of a highly sensitive CRP is not that sensitive. So other soft risk factors, lack of exercise, sedentary lifestyle, stress. Uh, medications, aspirin uh, will decrease the platelet cohesiveness. Um, and uh, statins are really the only medicine that has any evidence that shows that uh, not only will they decrease cholesterol, they'll decrease heart attacks, and they'll decrease overall death levels. Uh, none of the other medicines really have evidence for decreasing overall death levels. So niacin is the greatest medicine there is as far as affecting your numbers. It raises HDL, it lowers LDL, it raises... Um, um, you know, the good, it lowers the bad, it lowers triglycerides. The problem is, is that it does decrease the risk of heart attacks, but it doesn't decrease the risk of death. Um, bile acid resins, same kind of thing. And again, the thing with those is that they often aren't tolerated well because of the GI side effects. 
equestrian, things like that. Uh, some of the diabetes people, because they also do help diabetes, will start people on it to try to get the double benefit. Um, but again, they don't show any decrease in overall death rates. Red wine might lower lipids. Exercise definitely raises HDL, may lower uh, the others, tends to help triglycerides as well. Um, exercise is never a bad thing to recommend. The problem is, is that patients often have a hard time being disciplined enough to do it. So um, normal cardiac anatomy and physiology, basically the analogy of carpentry is the basic structure, plumbing is the circulation, and then electrical is the conduction system. In the right heart, you've got the superior, uh, superior and inferior vena cavas coming together to dump into the right atrium. You pass through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. You go out through the pulmonic valve, through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. At the lungs, you travel through the circulation, you oxygenate the blood, and then you come back through the pulmonary vein. Uh, any uh, blood vessel going to the heart is a vein, even though this is the only vein that carries oxygenated blood. It goes into the left atrium. Don't forget the left atrial appendage, which is where blood clots usually form goes through the mitral valve, into the left ventricle, and then out through the aortic valve, out into the peripheral circulation. So heart failure is something that you'll talk more and more about in um, pharmacology, so I'm not going to belabor it here, other than to say that usually heart failure is associated with one of two things. It's either associated with hypertension, long-standing damage to the heart from having too high blood pressure, or some kind of myocardial damage to the heart, whether it be cardiomyopathy, um, but most commonly a heart attack or a mild heart attack. Now, there's really two major factors or two major types of heart failure. Uh, we used to call them systolic and diastolic. We sometimes still do. Um, but basically, for a long time, we really only considered systolic heart failure, true heart failure. We now know that diastolic heart failure causes just as many problems. It is a little bit harder to treat, however. Uh, the more modern terms for diastolic and uh, systolic are heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Some pronounce that HEFREF, which is what I do. And then heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So if you have someone who has good systole, their heart is contracting just fine. They're shooting out 60% of their blood every time. The problem is, is that if you have hypertrophy of the ventricle and the ventricle is too small, it doesn't matter whether you're shooting out 60%, it's not as much uh, flow. Um, you're, you're ending up with problems with pulmonary hypertension. Um, so uh, HEFREF and HEFPEF are two very different things. Right and left heart failure, there's a lot of attention paid to those. It really is only an issue in an acute episode. So if you have a, a heart attack that affects the left side of the heart, it is going to cause backup into the lungs. They're going to have flash pulmonary edema. Uh, they're going to have dyspnea. They're going to have crackles in their lungs. They're going to uh, have a lot of respiratory symptoms. And then uh, if you had somebody that had a RVMI, uh, right ventricle MI, yes, they would back up into the periphery. They'd have more peripheral swelling. Uh, they'd have uh, back up into the liver. The thing with that is that almost always you're going to have elements of both because if you have uh, left-sided heart failure, eventually it's going to back up into the right side too. So you may have one that's predominantly more than the other, but almost always with someone with advanced enough heart failure, uh, you're going to end up with, um, with both. Um, Usual treatment, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, angiotensin receptor antagonists, and uh, diuretics. Uh, Entresto is a new medicine that's used for heart failure. Uh, it's an uh, angiotensin uh, receptor and niprilosin inhibitor. So it has uh, an extra effect. Um, uh, it's uh, actually, uh, they, they tried to use ACE inhibitors and they couldn't. They had to use ARBs. Um, but the combination of this medicine seems to have more impact on uh, anything than um, most others. Uh, it is very expensive still, so it's not a first-line medicine for heart failure. Uh, 
um, but it does seem to have some real benefit. Uh, I'm always a little cynical with the medicine until it's been out eight or 10 years, uh, until we really see exactly what it can do. So the, again, the circulation, uh, right-sided blockages are rare. Uh, you won't see them very often, uh, but, but you often will see. This is the widow maker if you block up at the left main, especially in a young person. It is very interesting because most people will develop collateral circulation as they get older. And so even if you have substantial decrease, you're not going to have as many problems. Um, but uh, uh, if you have a young person that has an acute blockage, it's going to be a big deal. So the circulation defines what heart is damaged, what part is damaged. So if it's up high, it'll be a lot of the left ventricle, et cetera. Now, cardiac conduction is a very different thing. Uh, the last uh, talk we did, we talked a fair amount about EKGs, um, but it does start in the SA node, goes down this internodal pathway, goes to the atrioventricular node, then down the bundles, and then out into the bundle branches. So if you have someone that has a defect in their cardiac conduction, it's usually going to be either in the sodium channels or the potassium channels. It may also be a calcium channel or a beta, beta blocker issue. Um, but really for antidysrhythmics, most of them are going to be uh, either this um, class one or class three. Um, Rarely do we talk about uh, class two or class four. We usually just talk about beta blockers or calcium blockers. Digoxin and adenosine uh, really are not defined. Some put them into a fifth category, um, but they work very differently than any of the others. And again, here's your basic monitor pattern. Uh, here's your elevation of the ST segment. And here is a widening of the QRS complex. You know, you can't see the little boxes, but you can see where this would be widened. Um, and so if, uh, if something starts out in a different place, there's going to be a different appearance to that uh, cardiac wave. So uh, that summarizes uh, the essentials. Again, we'll have a bunch of cases that we work things through. Uh, and there should be some other um, YouTube talks that we post.